Welcome to CC, the classic car show. In this episode, we get under the hood of a 1959 Chrysler Royal to find out what you need to do to keep it on the road. We take a much loved English open top roadster for a spin, find a classic of tomorrow for budding budget car buyers, and hop on the Pony Express for a top down cruise times two. Also on the show, how well do you know your chrome? We'll put you to the test. We shop for a bargain or not, plus a big cat purrs as we cut to the polish on this beautiful heavyweight Jaguar Sports Classic. So sit back and strap in for another exciting ride on the rambling road that is CC, Classic Cars. quite like driving on the open road in a classic roadster and the MGA ticks all the boxes. This little machine uses style with its smooth lines, sporty handling and retro styling. Over 103,000 MGAs were produced by the British Motor Corporation between 1959 and 1962. All but just over 5,000 stayed in England with the other cars shipped across the globe. So many of these vehicles were sold abroad that to this day the MGA is still the most exported UK built car. The MGA is considered by many to be the pinnacle of styling from BMC with its classic shape and combination of class and speed oozing from its inspired design. On the road, the MGA feels like a rocket. This feeling is in most part a result of the responsive handling, direct steering and driving position, which is very low to the ground. Of course, like many sports cars of the era, the driver is not cocooned in a heavy padded seat, surrounded by gadgets, spongy suspension and power steering. These vehicles are more like being in the cockpit of a war-era fighter plane. Simple driver comforts, necessary instrumentation, direct controls and a tight squeeze. And when we say tight squeeze, we mean it. If you are over six feet tall or you have shoulders wider than your average English aristocrat, you won't have much fun driving or extracting yourself from this roadster. Like many sports cars of the era, a long graceful front end gives the impression there is a whole lot of motor under the hood. The driving position is set back, literally behind the motor with the trunk or boot rolling back down to the rear. Sometimes looks can be deceiving though, and many enthusiasts consider the MGA to be severely underpowered, taking the sport out of the sports car. The engine in the original model was a 1500cc pushrod power plant, which produced about 68 horsepower. The same engine used in the Austins, Morrises and Wolseleys of the era. This actual car is one of the few 1600cc models manufactured, which boasts 93 horsepower, much more respectable for a roadster. Apart from the very rare twin cam power plant, there were only ever just over 2,000 built. This is as grunty as an MGA gets. BMC did a little to reduce the weight of the MGA to increase performance. The hood and trunk lids are aluminium to lighten the load, but the car is still very heavy. Surprisingly, the floor of these classics are made of timber. We're not sure a wooden floor fits in with the modern manufacturing processes of the 1960s. What we are sure of though, is the MGA owners and lovers don't care. You don't buy an MGA to go fast, you buy an MGA to go and look good while you're doing it. When the MGA was designed, looking good was the number one concern. And if you're thinking to yourself, where are the door handles? Well, this just makes our point. You see, the MGA has beautiful lines, gentle organic curves, sweeping style. Way too cool for door handles. 
in their wisdom, MG left them off. Instead, opting for a unique cable system inside the door frame, keeping the body clean and pristine. Of course, there is one thing that is synonymous with a classic MG, wire wheels. What started out as a construction method turned into a styling accessory. The MGA doesn't boast a lot of chrome, it's simple and understated. The curves do the talking, and the wheels ground the whole package as one of class, style and power. The real appeal of a classic MGA is the romance. The romance of rolling through the countryside, wind in your hair, wire wheels rotating under you, turning heads with your very stylish and fun machine. It's the same for all classic car lovers. For devotees of the MGA, it doesn't get better than this, and we're inclined to agree. So you've just hit 40. You're feeling cashed up. Your hairline is fast travelling to the northern hemisphere of your head. So you've decided to take the plunge and get yourself that little sporty classic car you've always dreamed of and get some wind in your hair before it all disappears and you find yourself shopping for a glue-on toupee. Right now, your heart is set on a sunbeam alpine, just like the one James Bond drove in Dr. No. Well, let's take a closer look at the damage to your hip pocket. There were several models of the Alpine produced between 1959 and 1968. The body shape didn't differ much between models, only performance. We've been looking around, and as far as classic cars go, the Alpine could be considered an entry-level classic. Of course, the prices vary, but generally, at any one time, there are a few on the market to choose from. This 1963 restored Series 2 unit in the UK was on the market for the princely sum of 9,000 US dollars, or 5,500 pounds. It's restored and looks pretty good. It does lack a little grunt, being the early model. For about 7,000 bucks, or around 4,000 pounds, you can slide into this restored 65 Series 3 Alpine. We found this 1967 Series 5 model for an ambitious $15,000, or around 9,000 pounds. The engine was replaced with a 2300cc Mitsubishi power plant. Pricey, not stock, but it may have enough juice to get you and your new hairpiece to where you want to go. There are usually stacks of Alpines on the market, so if the Sunbeam Alpine is your classic passion, get hunting. They won't be hard to find. Here's a challenge for all you classic car fans. Know your chrome gives you a peek at some close-ups of classic chrome. Look at the shapes. Do you recognise the lines? Can you tell which car sports this shiny styling? It's too early for clues, but we can tell you it's a car. It's a classic and it's very, very cool. Look closely and we'll give you more hints later in the show. Next on CC, the classic car show, we meet a big black cat, some tips for classic car owners, and we take a pony ride. This is a 1959 Chrysler Royal four-door sedan. It's in A1 mechanical condition, and due to the simplicity of its six-cylinder cube Dodge motor, anyone with a few basic skills can keep it that way. Of course, the best place to start is to take a look under the hood. On the left-hand side, check the brake and clutch fluids. No oil leaks are a good sign that all the hoses are intact. Quickly check the fan and expect the radiator cap and water level. Now take a look from the other side. Check the oil level with the dipstick, then the spark plugs and cables. Inspect the battery terminals to see if they're tight and free from any corrosion. Ensure the top radiator hose is nice and tight and that the fan belt is taut and has no cracks in it. The leads and wires to the distributor cap and starter motor should also be tight. The distributor cap should be clean and high tension leads all in place. OK, the engine looks good to go, so always fire her up, just to make sure she sounds as good as she looks. Don't forget to check the tyre pressures 
and make sure they're inflated correctly to the manufacturer's specifications. Also inspect the tread depth and check for uneven wear or foreign objects in the tyre tread. While the car is at the correct height, quickly check for rust under the mudguard here and under the front mudguard. The seals can be a weak spot for rust, but as we can see, everything is fine on this rust-free vehicle. So that's about it. A few simple maintenance checks should keep your Chrysler Royal in great condition for another 50 years. And the best thing of all is that you can roll up your sleeves and do it all yourself. Yep, there's only one thing better than the smell of aging leather. And that's the smell of engine grease on your hands. rolling off factory floors, only a select few will avoid the scrap heap and attain that most coveted of reputations, securing its future as a classic. This is a Mazda MX-5. It has all the features that we think will give it a fighting chance to one day be a collector's car. This classic of tomorrow gives you the feeling of the traditional open top roadster with the modern comforts and technological improvements of today. Sure, to really get the most out of this vehicle, you're going to have to look after it well. Keep it garaged as often as possible and hold on to it for 30 or 40 years. If that's not too hard for you to do, you can have a sports car of today and a classic of tomorrow. Jaguar has produced a series of elegantly styled and remarkably quick sports cars since the end of World War II. And incredibly, it's a lineage that still continues to this day. The XK series began in 1949 with the XK120, one of the most powerful cars of its day, and reached its peak with the production of the legendary XKE, commonly known as the E-Type Jag. With its combination of good looks, high performance and competitive pricing, the E-Type became the icon of 1960s motoring and, when the car was released in 1961, Enzo Ferrari even called it the most beautiful car ever made. Take a closer look at the E-Type and you'll discover it's the heart and soul of another beast that makes this big car purr, and that's the XK150. Built between 1957 and 1961, just short of 10,000 XK150 Roadsters, fixed head and dropped head coupes were built and sold. It was distinctively different from its predecessor, the XK140, with its curved one-piece windscreen, wider grille and high wing line along the sides. for just four years, the 150 Legacy lived on under the hood in thousands of E-Types that followed during the next decade. In fact, the Series 1 E-Type was powered by the very same 3.8-litre straight-six XK6 engine that drove the beefed-up XK150S. And boy, what an engine! It pumped out 265 brake horsepower, easily topped 135 miles per hour and could sprint from 0 to 60 in just 7 seconds. Standard equipment included a 3.4 litre twin cam, capable of over 130 miles per hour. But in February of 59, Jaguar added a Chrome S insignia, along with triple SU carburetors, a dual exhaust system, beefed up suspension and larger disc brakes. A 
and the 150 didn't just pack a punch under the hood. It came with a beautiful interior that featured stylish leather throughout. Roll-up windows and door handles were also new features, which until then were not considered essential equipment on sports cars of the day. And the result was a combination of excellent performance and handling, with a level of comfort and luxury rarely seen in sports cars of the period. The long flowing lines of the hood hinted at what was to come a decade later with the sleek new styling of the E-Type. But its front end, unlike its successor, maintained a traditional look with classic round headlights, the vertical chrome grille and of course the famous Jaguar badge. The tail end of this Jaguar is arguably even more beautiful than that of an E-Type with its exceptional chrome detailing. And then there's those familiar twin chrome exhausts that remind us of the raw power hidden beneath this graceful exterior and of the XK heritage. In March 1961, the first E-Type rolled off the production line and into the hearts and minds of the rich, famous and everyone with an eye for beautiful design. And its predecessors, including the 150, were quickly forgotten. Yet, without its XK lineage, the stunning styling and superb performance of the iconic E-Type Jag would never have been possible. Did you go with your first peak? How well do you know your chrome? Here's a quick update. Did you guess it right away or are you still pondering? Take a look at these shots. We're showing you a little more of the car here, so you should be able to pick it. The answer is coming soon. Also coming up, not one but two mules bust out of the stables and go for a run on the open road. So how well did you know your chrome? If you said it was an MGT, you would be right. The MGT was a launch pad for MG, establishing the British mark as a manufacturer of quality stylish sports cars, with the MGA, like the model we saw earlier, following in its footsteps. The classic road trip doesn't need a destination or a predetermined route. It's less about getting from A to B and more about everything in between. It's about the experience, the thrill of the open road, the awesome beauty of magnificent vistas, and above all, about horsepower. And when you want pure horsepower, you can't beat a pony. Yep, for classic all-American muscle, your ride doesn't get any better than a Mustang. Unless, of course, you're lucky enough to have two. Meet Bo and Bell, a pair of first-generation convertible Mustangs. The first saw the light of day back in 1966. These two buttes look as good now as they did on the day they rolled off the production lines almost 50 years ago. Sporting the now famous GT badge, both these Fords are equipped with the original GT equipment package. And yes, just in case you were wondering, that's where you fill this baby up. When it comes to gas caps, they really don't make them like they used to. Both these Mustangs feature fully automatic electric soft tops, an original feature built into the car way back in 66. So now that the sun's up, let's get those tops down and let Belle and Bo loose on the open road. cars were built for roads like this. They like to go fast and straight. And if the road's clear, nothing gets the heart pumping more than opening up the gas and overtaking whatever's in your way. The first 
generation Mustangs were produced between 64 and 66 and broke all kinds of records when they came out. Over one and a half million pony cars hit the road in just two years and with so many vehicles out there, tracking down parts is a breeze. It looks like this road trip has taken a quick detour off the beaten track. But as we can see with their short wheelbase and wide track, Bell and Bow look just as good on the dirt as they do on the hard stuff. Back on the bitumen and time to work out which way to head next. Yep, it looks like due south is as good a way as any. These cars came fitted with many luxury features that are still considered optional extras on many modern cars. Power steering, disc brakes and even air conditioning were all standard features on Mustangs of the period. Despite their age, driving these Mustangs isn't very different from driving a modern car. Sure, they won't hug the road and don't have the same kind of turning circle, but in terms of ease, they're just the same. The big difference being that today's cars don't have as much style and charisma. So let's pull over and take a closer look at these two beauties. Both cars have their original pony interiors with those embossed stallions that remind us of their majestic equestrian heritage. Both seats are a classic two-tone, while Bell's upholstery is simple and clean. Both interiors are magnificent and their pristine condition belies their real age. Under the hood, these buttes look every bit as good as they do on the outside. Getting back behind the wheel and hitting the back roads, we can see what makes these cars so special. With their soft tops down, winding their way through spectacular scenery, it's possible to forget that we now live in the 21st century. They take us back to another era, and they do it in a way that only a Mustang can. So that's it for this road trip on another road to nowhere. And what better way to bid farewell to Bo and Belle than to watch these two ponies ride off into the distance to who knows where. much-loved runabout to the rare and valuable collector's items. One thing we all agree, there's nothing cooler than a classic. Like this Lamborghini Mura, once owned by international model Twiggy, and still oozing 1960s style. Or this E-Type Jaguar, recently voted the world's most beautiful car. Of course, like you saw in the buyer's guide, you don't have to be rich to drive a classic, you just have to love classic cars. 